That'll give it Brian the floor. Well, Kurt and I went some time back and, and got talking about questions of experience. And, uh, and so there, I, have, I have little explicit trash talk in, in the second presentation um, uh, of the literal kind, but definitely some trash talk of the, the more uh, conceptual kind. Um, and, uh, and so uh, what, uh, what, I, what I'm really doing, my work has been around um, really two sets of questions. One, the, the production of experience, and the second around really a, 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 a whole range of questions about why what we make is made. Not from a, an ontological perspective, but rather from a discursive perspective. Like what, what informs our productions? How do we understand where these productions might sit within a field of discourses and cultural practices? And then ultimately, how even the very practices of architecture that are pursued through different channels produce certain kinds of work, or, or if they produce certain kinds of work. And so when asked to talk about objects, I immediately thought of two objects that are more recent on my radar uh, of ones that um, I think concern me a lot in terms of productions of architecture that come from my earlier work. Um, they're both really big. Um, and so one, I'm only able to bring a, a model of, so courtesy of my son, uh, a model of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Um, and, uh, and the second is even so large that a scale model wouldn't even be portable. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so I, I thought these would be useful ways to, to frame a conversation. And also I should say, so I'll be talking a lot about Dubai today, and, and I, I, I feel I always sort of, uh, have to preface a lot of my work with a, a bit of an apology, which is I actually would like to be about five or six years behind the kind of critical cycle of inquiry for architectural theory. Um, it's, it's my own sort of post-occupancy evaluation. Um, and so if I'm, if I'm trying to understand where what we make comes from, the, the first wave of theoretical discourse is part of my subject matter. And, uh, and so I'm looking at these projects, which we've heard a lot about. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I hope not to bore you by rehashing um, the, the same kind of uh, inquiries that we've already been um, tired of hearing, uh, but hopefully soon. I pass the bird. You, you may pass the bird. Pass yes. the bird. <laughs> pass the bird. Pass the bird. <laughs> All right. So object one, no surprise, Burj Khalifa. Um, you, you know the stats. Um, uh, it, it, it is, you know, the, the currently the tallest building, but probably not for very long, um, uh, that we as humankind have get made. Nearly a kilometer in height, um, approaching at the top a, a footprint that's no bigger than the size of this room. Um, and, uh, and, and kind of extreme as a certain kind of production. So a, a really big object. Um, and so when one looks at an object like this, I feel we have to understand first what it is. And again, not ontologically speaking, but rather descriptively. What is it and what forms does it exist? And so um, an object like this is, uh, you know, is this, right? I mean, it's actually a very elegantly detailed building. Um, uh, all of the firms involved did a tremendous job producing a refined piece of material architecture. It exists in the everyday lives of millions um, as they travel to Dubai, serving as backdrops to kind of common evening scenes like this. And this, I should say, this was like 45 degrees outside, so this was a, a, a small crowd, um, uh, 45 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, a small crowd. Um, uh, I was unfortunately there in June and July. Um, and, uh, and, and it also is this. It is the hype, right? So, you know, I am Burj Khalifa. I have a life force of collective aspirations and the aesthetic union of many cultures. I stimulate dreams, stir emotions, and awaken creativity. It's a fucking building. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing types that we're used to coming out of Dubai. It is this, right? Have you felt the winds of change? Have you felt the world shift? Um, downtown Dubai is the single development um, uh, by the developer, Imar, um, who is uh, not a familial developer, but a next of kin uh, developer, if you will. Um, so it is technically not state-owned property, yet it is still extended family-owned property. Um, Imar is the second largest developer in Dubai, uh, uh, second to Nakheel. Uh, Nakheel has done all of the coastal stuff, you know, the world and the palms and all that kind of work, um, as well as the progenitors of the, the second project I'm going to show. Um, but the center of now is their theme, and uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating theme which situates, so downtown Dubai is the name of the development, of course, it's, it's nowhere near what we in the West consider downtown. Um, uh, it, 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 it's also nowhere near a conventional downtown in the Western sensibility because there is no downtown in conventional Western sensibility to Dubai. Um, you, you know a bit of the history, uh, the town was you know, one square kilometer more or less until 1960, um, and now it is what it is today, um, uh, mostly uh, due to an early wave of oil-funded investment um, and 
then the second wave of what I really want to talk about today, which is real estate <coughs> investments um, and, and what it means to produce buildings or to, as a theorist, talk about buildings that are produced not as much as buildings, but as investment. Um, it is also this. It is the center of tourism. Um, and, uh, and so I was fortunate enough to you know, uh, spend you know, $100 to get one of these uh, uh, photographs uh, of my dossier for events such as this. Um, it is also this, of course. Right? Um, this is great. Um, this is actually uh, this is from the filming of Mission Impossible, um, but not actually of the filming of Mission Impossible, but rather someone's webcam. Um, uh, actually filming him and climbing outside the building during the shooting of it. And, um, this is just a found piece on YouTube, again, kind of talking about the collective imagination. So the building is not only a backdrop of a film, um, but it is a, the, the filming of the film at the Virgin Dubai is a backdrop for home video. And so the spectacle of him climbing on the outside of the building um, uh, is the same as the spectacle of the movie um, and the spectacle of him performing his own stunts for this movie. Um, all of, I feel wrapped in a kind of architectural conceit. Right, this is the same space I was standing in. Um, that is Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah, doing his own stunts on the outside of the version. Oh, actually, the outside. So, the, so the, the stunts were partly blue screen, but primarily shot on site, actually, by himself. Um, what I like about this one is if you look at a lot of the press release material for this, it's very slick. And even though he's performing his own stunts, it's like the wall, the plum, and he's not, I mean, here he looks like he's scared to show this. <laughs> 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 there you go. <laughs> um, uh, it's also this. And this is the, the, the website of, um, uh, of, uh, of the, the downtown Dubai development um, that, that beautifully uh, takes us through with this kind of imaginary day of, uh, of course, superstar models. Um, the website, when you visit it to reinforce the center of now theme, registers your time of the day in Dubai and positions you chronologically. The backdrop even changes color as we move from time to time. Um, and, and one can understand within this development, which is significantly large, nowhere near as large as the one I'm about to tell you about, but um, uh, the, the downtown Dubai development um, is, uh, is somewhere on the order of, uh, of uh, I think it's, what's the other that's three million, this one's about, um, yeah, it's about 500 million square feet um, uh, of, uh, of area of the development. It includes about 150 buildings over 40 stories. Um, but it's also this, which is the view from the top of the Virgin Dubai in the other direction, the Virgin Dubai. Um, in the other direction, towards the yet undeveloped uh, uh, parts of uh, parts of Dubai, this is the artificial extension of the canal. Um, this is a, a, a remnant camel racetrack um, that is still yet to be developed um, uh, as, a, as a building site. Um, it is also uh, this Lego model that's being passed around. It is the, the reinforcement of its thematization through other products. It is this, which is the, the Burj Khalifa um, as depicted by uh, the, the makers of Life After People. Um, so the, the kind of you know, calamity of collapse and the, the calamity of destruction, this is 250 years after people. Um, uh, what happens uh, to, uh, to this particular project? I mean, these visualizations are, are fantastic, right? And then ultimately, um, you can see what she's about to describe. Um, it doesn't take a structural engineer to understand this one. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, there <laughs> And so what I find important about this, and one can say that you know, at a certain level, any significant monument reaches this kind of apotheosis of, of public understanding and mass media attention. Um, but what I really want to look at is, is not how past monuments have served that purpose serendipitously, but how projects like this are constructed to serve that purpose. So the production of an architecture which is already understood to be part of this landscape um, that exists within the larger territory of its media dissemination and production um, is what I find uh, significant. Um, so to go from uh, this, uh, uh, this is just the footprint of the building itself, uh, out to the downtown Dubai development, um, which again, uh, I was actually there commissioned a, 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 a chapter coming out of Dubai Mall, which is the largest mall in the world right now. Um, and, uh, and so I was there to study that. That's 12 million square feet. Um, to uh, the larger context of Dubai, so if we understand again, kind of Dubai 1960 was, was that, 
right? Um, and uh, a little 60s, actually, I have to say, a little bit of development along the creek, um, through to the creek extension, and the fact that, you know, this is the second palm here, and the third palm is over here, this is one just sort of sand right now. Um, the new airport that you're reading about is down in here, the, the new airport. Isn't that the world in the middle? That is the world in the middle, yes. That is the, the world that is sinking. So object two. Object two takes place in this. Um, object two is Dubai land. Um, and Dubai land looks exactly like it does right there right now. Um, this aerial photography is from 2012. So um, uh, it has a, a kind of landing strip in it, which is a remnant from industrial uh, freight transfer. Um, to the construction of Jebel Adi, which was the, the port which radically transformed Dubai into a large free trade port. Um, but this has been developed. Um, and this development is, um, uh, to my knowledge, to my research, the largest single developer development in the world, 3 billion square feet. And so what is 3 billion square feet? There. Um, so the entire <laughs> city of Buffalo, as done by one developer, um, interestingly, of course, um, and this uh, certainly correlates to some of what Adrian is talking about in terms of planning, um, one developer, which again, we have to put on a very different framework when trying to understand the context of Dubai, because it's one developer that is also the state, um, yet it is a separate organization. So there are these, these, these what um, cynically we might call shell organizations, but um, uh, fundamentally separate organizations with their own accounting that are wholly owned by the state. And, uh, and when asked, when I was interviewing um, uh, a number of people there at different levels of government enterprise, that basically uh, a gift is made. Um, and so the, the, the government of Dubai, um, uh, Sheikh Maktoum al Rashid al, oh God, I don't know, I got it wrong, I'm sorry. She, the, the ruler of UAE, the ruler of Dubai, very similar names, I'm sorry, I, wanted to, I, I get it mixed up too much. Um, but, um, but basically hands a big portion of the, the, the so-called public land um, which is really private land because it's a um, it's a, 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 a monarchy um, to the developer who then develops it. And so, um, in looking at um, this three billion square feet of land, we have the same question, right? So, what produces the spectacle of uh, of Dubai land? Um, you know, I mean, these are the classic uh, stats of Dubai, where you get um, you know it's, it's opening in 2010, it's still presented as uh, as, as information there um, uh, at the at the visitor center. So, of course, the reality of Dubai land is this. Um, in fact, the entrance to it, it doesn't have an exit on the highway. You have to drive over the curb um, uh, to, get, uh, to get into the space. Um, and then this is that. You know, this is what we see in the three billion square feet. Um, and, uh, but yet it is this, right? So this, uh, this is a model that is approximately 1,500 square feet uh, scale model of Dubai Island. Um, and, uh, and so it is this, and it is this, and it is this, and it is this, and it is this. Um, and it is this, right? So this project just goes on and on and on, and the, the number of developments within this that constitute a vision of a single development as an urban enterprise, right, as you read, for 15 million people, um, uh, is a remarkable enterprise to begin to conceptualize what a new city might actually be. And so um, my, my question then is how we understand these objects. What is it that allows us to grapple with these objects as architectural critics or as architects trying to understand what it is that we in the world. And, um, and so um, I, I'd like to kind of turn to some of my prior work that, that for me helps grapple with these, these, these um, uh, helps engage, you know, to, to bring up a term uh, before, so that I can kind of immerse myself in these spectacles and understand them from, from the inside out. Um, this is, uh, I, I would argue, and I have argued before uh, in, in my writing, this is probably one of the most uh, critical works of architectural theory uh, of the 21st century. Um, just right at the, the transition of the 21st century, 1999. Um, Pine and Gilmore business consultants um, for writing a book uh, called The Experience Economy, solidifying um, really kind of for the first time uh, in, a, in a sort of compendium, uh, a whole bunch of thinking that had been evolving in the post-service economy for what to do next. Um, if we've shifted from an industrial economy to one providing services, and that economy is now sort of like falling by the wayside because business is struggling, um, what is it that we need to do next? And what we need to do next is we need to provide experience. This is a kind of a, a, a pablum uh, at this point uh, in, in retail literature. Uh, and, um, and it was, it did we certainly lose a tremendous amount of momentum uh, with uh, the financial difficulties of the last uh, you know, four or five years. But, um, but until uh, 2008, we saw an increasing development and transition of the provision of services to the provision of experiences. And I argue this is an important work of architectural theory 
Um, because in fact it positions the making of space central to this production of experience. Um, and so you remember early on I said um, that, that I'm, I'm kind of looking at this question of, of what these buildings are discursively. When I do that through the filter of experience, um, I, I should clarify that I'm trying to do so in a way that is looking at experience not as a, uh, as a kind of, let's say, uh, empirical embodied experience nor even a phenomenological experience of engagement, but rather the logistics of experience production and how today's commercial economies and certainly architecture the service of these commercial economies um, positions the production of experience such that those other understandings, more embodied understanding of experience, are mechanized, um, I wouldn't say necessarily controlled, but mechanized to an extent where they can be um, fiscally accountable, right, which is ultimately the goal of these kind of projects. So if I'm building a building whose primary purpose is it's a real estate investment, I have to have a certain amount of fiscal accountability towards the experience value that we provide. And these guys do a, a you know, tremendously mundane job, but a tremendous job of actually uh, of making that, that, that argument. Um, so, a bit of a plug, this is the second most important work of our text. This is, uh, this is my text which, um, uh, which brings their work, you know, literally, um, uh, artificial experience economy uh, to the floor as a way of grappling with that theory. So, um, I'll turn to some diagrams which you may know, um, uh, and uh, these are diagrams that are classic to, or, or at least represented within the last um, uh, half century of theory. Uh, an important legacy of contemporary architectural thought that form a really important piece of my work in helping frame ways of thinking of instrumentalizing uh, our engagements with the world in the domain of space making that have been leveraged either explicitly or implicitly by a lot of these concerns that I'm looking at. And so I'm talking about Kevin Lynch's five points, uh, uh, for example, to try to understand uh, an advancement of behavioral psychology in space and instrumentalization of that. You know, Repudiates the fact that he, I mean, he literally paraphrases people that he says he doesn't use. Um, uh, Christopher Alexander, um, in the more computative uh, breakdown and organization of the structuration of spatial relationships, and Christian Norbert Schultz, in what is, I think, philosophically very advanced, but also at the root, very quantifiably, uh, I need my sub right here behind me, um, <laughs> you know, very much influenced by uh, a very strict and mechanized understanding of the Gestalt as a way of, of producing and um, and, um, and so, central to my work is this man um, and this creation, Walt Disney, standing in front of the original construction of the Anaheim Cinderella's Palace, um, primarily because, and, and I know I'm just kind of following the footsteps of, of, of others before me who have uh, tried to position some of this work as significant architectural theory, um, but I promise I'm not going to make it the piazza to tell you later my life. Um, but um, uh, the, the, you know, so, so like Charles Moore, I'm trying to advance a critical project looking at the significance of this work of memory placemaking, um, but I'm also trying to argue that what is there is not the, 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 the kind of structuralist understanding of the aesthetics of design production, like Charles Moore ultimately uh, uh, ended up arguing through his work, um, but rather the kind of endemic economic logic that produce an architecture that advances some of these same uh, problematics. And so if we take you know, Lynch's um, uh, five concerns um, and we look at uh, what they are in his terminology, um, we find, and these are contemporary because um, you know, they weren't exactly reading each other because they were writing at exactly the same time. Um, uh, you know, so Disney's uh, first theme park opened uh, five years before um, uh, the um, uh, of the city, but subsequent to his first two essays on the linear narrative uh, in, uh, in space as he was looking in Boston. Um, so, so these five terms are literally engaged in um, uh, uh, Disney theme planning logics, and, uh, and so they serve as the narrative of the organization of space, much like um, we can understand, and, and, and this is a diagram from notes on the synthesis of form of Alexander's dissertation, um, uh, in the production of uh, and segmentation of organization of things like this, which is the Peter Pan Pfeiffer project at the first Disney theme park. And so what Disney did, I think what was really significant in this production of experience is that they had a very specific mandate, which is, you know, they were funded by ABC, so at the service of the media enterprise, they produced a theme park which was made to spatialize the narratives in their film work. 
right? So it's a very clear mandate. And they did what they knew best, which was to produce storyboards and inscribe narratives in space. And they had, you know, not a ton of money um, to do this because ABC was quite strict and, and um, the early Disney was you know, nearly a bankrupt enterprise. Um, but nonetheless, we're able to leverage enough funds to put architecture at the service of this in a really kind of interesting uh, way. Um, to the point that um, uh, when I was doing my research uh, and interviewing the head of architecture and environmental design at Disney uh, in, uh, in 2004, um, and so again, so I point this date out because it was very <coughs> the financial collapse. Um, uh, Disney was, um, uh, had AEC projects, architecture, engineering, construction projects to the tune of $6.4 billion. So they were the, the largest single AEC firm in the world, right? And it was all their work. Like they didn't do outside commissions. They just didn't work for themselves. Um, and, uh, and so they, they, they clearly are, are, I don't know if they're doing something right, but they're doing something kind of critically innovative in the ways they're understanding the architectural mechanism, the space making mechanism. So to go from a kind of simple um, uh, spatial logistics of organizing uh, a narrative, um, you know, so this is, you know, this is London, this is Neverland, and this is Skull Rock, um, in a scale architectural drawing. Um, to the collapsing of that and the actual um, enclosure of the riot films into the little kind of tangly ships that you fly on. Um, that give you a sense of the scale of that drawing. Two more mechanized versions of this where uh, they're, they're, they're really innovative patent for the Omni Mover, um, this uh, kind of single track based uh, orientational device that takes you to the Haunted Mansion ride, um, according to that path up there. Um, so from the kind of spatially organizational to the mechanical uh, way of telling a narrative. To ultimately the computational way of telling a narrative, um, uh, this temple, the Forbidden Eye Ride, was their first uh, kind of augmented reality uh, 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 ride uh, experience. Whereby, uh, and I, I really admire these drawings. Um, uh, if one can separate the kind of cheese factor of the narrative away from the the, the, the philosophically rich spatial content of them, um, which is that we have sort of you know queuing area. Um, we actually so queuing area comes all the way here. Um, this is where you actually transfer and get on little jeeps. Um, and then jeeps basically only drive that far. Um, and then they become a, a, a in-place fixed kind of roller coaster ride. And, uh, and it's, it's randomly determined. So there are multiple paths that can be taken on this ride that are computationally uh, generated uh, based on a series of narratives, kind of like a really hyper, uh, uh, internet, what do you call it, like a hypertext that you need kind of project. Um, and, uh, and so then you sort of come back on the other end do a little bit more physical movement before you return. So again, from the, the spatial to the mechanical to the computational and ultimately to the mediated, um, uh, I, I want to play this video in, entirely. Back to architecture in a pretty profound way. 
So if we see, um, you know, again, just framed by Disney, the Disney project moving from a um, uh, from the, the, the kind of spatial organizational to the mechanical to the computational to the highly mediated and immersively spatial, um, we get this kind of coming back to the point where architecture uh, is playing a, a pretty significant role. Um, to the point where we can then leverage the really important, I say something cynically, here's my trash talk, um, important and instrumentalized work of people like Lynch, Alexander, um, and Herbert Schultz to produce um, inscriptions of, of entertainment capacity, design algorithms uh, for the organization of space. Um, uh, kind of similar in this regard. Um, so ultimately, what we see is an architecture or uh, a making of space um, designed to do things that we see to be quite human, um, right? Which is to transform us in space. Um, Merge with, you know, to transform our experiences so that we go into a space and we feel transformed. We feel like we had a revelation, right? I mean, that's a kind of classic uh, to, uh, to the, the aesthetic project of, of our architecture. Um, what's interesting about this is that the Experience Economy book says that uh, if we move beyond services, and you're not trying to sell a service anymore, and you're, you're trying to sell a brand and a brand affiliation, what's the product? The product is actually you. The, the product is the individual. And, um, and so they argue very explicitly, you know, the, the, the person is the product, and what we need to do is begin to craft the organization of those experiences, which again rely very much on the space itself, um, in order to reduce problematic experiences or what this fantastic book is referring to, what, what they call brand gremlins, um, are, uh, are glitches, right? So, that, so you know, th this compares basically with alternative art and design practice. Um, to things like vehicle wheels out of alignment, sand in the gears of machinery, bugs in the software program, um, uh, to the point where they actually identify, uh, if you can't read these, trust gremlins, esteem gremlins, distinctiveness gremlins, value gremlins, relevance gremlins, and distribution gremlins. Um, uh, these are interferences by individuals against a brand identity um, and are sought, you know, as you might expect, uh, to be kind of reduced in, in one way or another. All right, so um, what's the big thing that's this leaves out. But the big thing it leaves out, of course, is what this object is. And, and to get back to the object conversation that we were asked to do, um, uh, to frame our, our conversation around, what, what I'd like to say is that when we look at an object like this, and I would argue that much of 20th century architectural production is this now, um, 21st century architectural production uh, is, is this now, um, this is not the object, right? Um, this is not the object any more than that is obviously not the object. Um, we look at that empty terrain and we say, well, this is an unfulfilled architectural project. It's vaporware of, of a magnitude that exceeds all comprehension of possible realization, right? So even if the coffers were enormously filled, it is difficult to imagine a single developer producing Buffalo in eight years, right? Especially with the kind of extremity of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the, the building environment um, and uh, the labor conditions and uh, material production there in uh, Dubai. Um, but, but so if this is not the object, and that is not the object, what is the object of architectural production today within this context? Well, the object is experience. The, the object is the production of an experience for which the built material thing um, is merely one component of a much larger artifactual system. Um, and, and, and so to, to, to begin to understand how this shifts, and this is my point, how this shifts architectural discourse and architectural conversation is that I think that we need to be very explicit in the way that as architects we talk about the architectural artifact and the architectural object, such that it's explicitly inclusive of this domain and that our inquiries seek to define this domain whenever we try to talk about a built object of some sort. Um, and the fallacy is that we continue to reify the, the architectural object in the material production in a way that belies this complexity that architecture is producing today. And we do that disciplinarily, we do that scholastically, we do that in our own scholarship, and I, and I find it just immensely problematic and allowing these things to continue to be um, confidently produced and then critiqued politely, right? Um, and so if you look at the, you know, the, there are two really fantastic almanacs um, uh, that are in the volume uh, series on um, uh, Middle East architecture. And, um, and there's, some, there's some really polite critique in there. And it's, it's engaged, deep research, but it's very polite. And, and by its polite test, what I'm talking about is the way that it refers to the, the, the 
production of architecture, even in the acknowledgement of, of the complexity of the situation, is somehow reified in the material form of the buildings which are or are not produced. And so the spectacle is not this. The spectacle is actually this kind of interesting underbelly that, you know, certainly when I visited this, you know, reaffirmed suspicions um, uh, of this kind of very complex task of mediating and modulating the experience, right? So I, I, I have now hopefully exposed you to a certain kind of experience in Dubai land, um, and yet we can see that the darn thing doesn't exist in any material way, yet we still talk about it as a very significant artificial project. So what is it that we're talking about, right? So that's the object, the, the, the object that I would like to throw out there today, um, is that kind of reaffirmation of the, 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 the sort of difficulty uh, of tracing objects, but also the, the important mandate that I feel to do so in with that, it's great. The production of art. I'm very interested in this uh, question that Brian just raised about the kind of uh, calculus of experience in a way. I'm very interested in the spatial calculus of waste management, uh, which I'd like to introduce uh, in just a bit. Um, I think for me, I'm very, as I think many here know from uh, seeing me talk about this work a few times this year. Um, here at UB, uh, I'm, I'm interested in volatile objects. I'm interested in things which are difficult to contain or control, uh, things which break down and explode into public consciousness. Here is an image of the garbage strike in Naples, which was highly publicized a few years ago. Um, we live with these things, of course, every day. We live with trash bags. Uh, air, water, and waste uh, come to my mind. The next, next slide. <laughs> so, so is, is air, for instance, an object? I would say yes. It has particular uh, physical properties and dispositions. We feel it and breathe it. I'm, I'm doing so right now, so are all of us. Um, uh, next slide. Water is digested constantly. I think of uh, something Linda Schneekloff, who was here with us earlier, uh, she constantly was reminding me that our bodies are made of Lake Erie. So the water, which is the water, of course, we drink in Buffalo, so much of our body content is Lake Erie. Um, Lake Erie shapes our bodies. So this is not just any water. It's a very particular water with a particular set of properties and histories, which uh, organizations such as uh, river keepers, for instance, in Buffalo, constantly engage with as, as a, a dilemma. Uh, next slide. So I would say that uh, trash, of course, is equally pervasive and nearly as intangible. Though it is not as amorphous as water or air, it permeates air and water with smell and chemicals. It is constantly on the move, like air and water, from source to disposal, dragging smells, gases, and liquefied byproducts of decomposition, as well as the kind of traces of life that we can invest in these objects with it. So our efforts to contain trash are immense, if largely, I would say, unknown to most. Next slide, please. So waste infrastructure is, I would argue, increasingly secretive about its workings, laboring to disappear trash as efficiently uh, and seamlessly as possible. I think this is something all of us can probably relate to in our daily engagement with waste. There's so much of it that we don't know because it is a process that is in some ways, so seamless, uh, at least uh, in the United States, uh, North America, and largely in Europe. So I'd say that I'd argue that seeing the longer duration, this is a paradigm that's relatively new. Uh, it emerges really out of the 19th century. Uh, next image, please. So waste was quite literally everywhere in the 19th century, and even in the early 20th century. It filled the streets of cities like New York and Chicago. This is an image of uh, Bleecker Street in New York City before and after uh, public cleaning initiatives were brought into being in New York City. Uh, it was, of course, as the talk image suggests, and I think was fairly typical, it was unavoidable, unavoidable and constantly engaged with. Uh, it smelled and um, <laughs> it was visually present. It was aesthetically very present to uh, citizens of these cities. So out of the volatile mixture of urban reforms, smells, and diseases, ideas about modern sanitation and what would later be called waste management emerged. 
So waste was intensely politicized around the turn of the century at this very moment of transition, which is shown in this photograph. And it colored debates about responsibility, civic virtues, and psychological fitness. So for instance, the presence of waste was associated with uh, notions of, kind of bad behavior, alcoholism. You see this in a lot of colonial discourses, for instance, in India, uh, where, for instance, slums and uh, low-lying areas of cities were considered to be breeding grounds for uh, 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 kind of amoral behavior. So there's this kind of constant sense, that, or, or, or a significant link made between kind of moralism and the, the physical, very sensible uh, uh, presence of waste. So in this sense, waste was figured centrally in shaping ideas about public space as something invested with common civic responsibility, norms of ventilation, drainage, and impermeability, and so many other aspects of urban life that we continue to live with, and which I argue are also an alternative uh, and very uh, important history of uh, modern architecture after the 19th century. Sanitation is the kind of other side of much of the architecture and concepts that we live with. So for instance, when we talk about liberating the ground plane, we often forget that this emerges uh, out of a kind of sanitary anxiety for removing uh, habitable space from the kind of dampness of the earth. So, and as I said before, this was an intensely sensorial politics. Coupling the smell of shit, as we see here, and rotting garbage with active social movements and political conflict. So for instance, in New York City at this time, uh, there was a kind of efflorescence uh, which I think is largely unmatched today, uh, of, uh, for instance, women's organizations about uh, the kind of cleaning up the streets and also the demand to actually form uh, municipal and public uh, waste management authorities. Not then yet called management. Sanitation is really different language at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So sanitation was largely an aesthetic enterprise, but literally cleaning the streets to prevent disease. These associations were proven wrong, of course, by bacteriology. Waste management is a more sophisticated technology of managing urban space. It is largely an engineering problem, not a political one. Though those who live in proximity to sites such as landfills, incinerators, or transfer stations would probably say otherwise. And I'd like to add here, it's not only an engineering problem, but it's a problem of information. And I think that Brian's talk was well, it provoked me to kind of be a bit more explicit about this, this assignment, I suppose, because it really is a kind of a game of uh, calculation and efficiency at the end of the day about distances, cost, uh, the cost of petrol, for instance, uh, and really how much volume one can pack, for instance, in a landfill, and what techniques it takes to actually produce that most efficiently. Uh, next slide, please. So, in a sense, I would say, given uh, not only our experience in the United States right now, but I would say also in countries like uh, India, where uh, much of the kind of paradigm that we live with of uh, basically kind of drawing all waste away to landfills and placing it in the uh, hands or responsibility of uh, a few large kind of infrastructure corporations or municipal authorities. Um, I would say that containment appears to us increasingly successful, but I would argue that because of because the poor and peripheral continue to bear the burden of its toxic consequences, containment and enclosure cannot be considered a resounding success as, as it's claimed to be. So, um, though waste is in North America and increasingly in the rest of the world no longer considered to be a public problem, it persistently creeps back into public life and politics in unexpected ways. So it is incredibly volatile, as I was saying earlier, chemically speaking, uh, and its status as a resource means that it continues to drive significant so-called informal economies of scavenging and recycling around the world. So its volatility, for instance, is made uh, very present when, say, one visits the landfill. And you start to understand how, if not properly mitigated, uh, the landfill becomes a, an incredibly dangerous and quite literally explosive uh, uh, form in the landscape an object in the landscape um, that, sort of, that, uh, that surrounds it. So for instance, it's, in, it's, it's highly mediated, uh, highly mitigated and engineered in order to actually kind of maintain the system that we, that we live with. Uh, and so this is a, this is a diagram of uh, informal waste economies in Bangalore. This paradigm is now shifting, but the blue being uh, the 
the contractors that have been hired to basically pick up waste and door to door collection, much like we do here. Uh, but what is interesting about this is paint, which is uh, all of these kind of other economies, which actually kind of feed off the various steps and moments of rupture within this given waste stream. And what's interesting is that we see how it is actually, in some ways, also brought back into the formal economy in a kind of loop. Uh, next slide, please. So, much like water, electricity, and other forms of infrastructure, its volatility continues to provoke unsettling questions about collective life, space, and responsibility. Whatever its enclosure and containment within landfill ships and other containers, it constantly seeps, structures, and escapes the boundaries of target for containing it. So, um, you know, I, I'd like to kind of put out there that, uh, especially within the last decade, we have witnessed a number of significant moments of critical infrastructural urban collapse, such as the flooding of New Orleans pictured here, the flooding of uh, Mumbai a few years ago, uh, the, the electricity blackout of, I think it was 2000, was that 2008, 2005, I can't remember. Um, but in a sense, what, what were otherwise kind of very taken for granted uh, infrastructures uh, of kind of urban control and containment of containing, for instance, uh, water in New Orleans is quite literally much of that part of the city is sinking because of subsidence, uh, is suddenly kind of exploded. And in a sense, what that does is also uh, throw into stark relief, as Katrina did, uh, the kind of politicization of water in a region such as New Orleans and questions about who has control and authority over this? Much of that authority uh, over time in the, uh, the southern Louisiana region um, uh, in the 20th century was ceded to, for instance, the Army Corps of Engineers. So a lot of figures were being pointed at this moment. But what's interesting is that these questions about uh, responsibility over a, an issue such as quite literally containing something with volatile water is suddenly very politicized. So next slide. So coming back to waste, I would say whose responsibility is the Pacific garbage patch? Where do we draw political boundaries around something such as this? It is totally uncontained in the way I say it landfill is. It is not associated with with it's it's uh, even though they're kind of comparing it in scale to something that we can associate geographically like Texas, uh, no one can claim ownership over this environmental phenomenon, which is now the size of a small country floating in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, next slide, please. Or I would say uh, this is also a kind of issue which emerges in the kind of daily, the politics of daily life that we live with uh, on, on this kind of boundary or this line of curtilage, uh, which is a word I like very much, <laughs> uh, which is that line drawn between uh, the kind of private domain of the house and the domain of the street. It's a very contested boundary. Uh, it's a, intensely contested threshold. So for instance, uh, in the case of California versus Greenwood, which is a Supreme Court case, uh, this question of when one puts one's garbage on the street, uh, whether it is still uh, a kind of private matter of concern uh, was the central question. Basically, a uh, uh, someone had been tipped off that I think that the person who had put the trash out on the street uh, was a drug user. And so the question was whether the police actually had, uh, were uh, rightful in, in actually investigating that trash uh, without a warrant. So uh, out of this uh, came a kind of uh, landmark Supreme Court case about uh, publicity and privacy, and where those boundaries are drawn. How do we draw these kind of boundaries about ownership and responsibility? So this was a series done by a woman in LA of abandoned couches. But at what moment does the couch, kind of spatially speaking, uh, become public property. I see this all the time uh, in, in Buffalo, for instance, where uh, objects uh, occupy various proximities to buildings and houses and otherwise kind of private property and are in some ways ambiguous in terms of their availability to uh, appropriation, say by you or me driving by. Uh, of course, these kind of feed in themselves into kind of very interesting economies of uh, reuse. Uh, the next slide, please. So, so whether the kind of NIMBYism movement about toxic waste sites in the 1970s or the kind of aforementioned conflicts about street cleaning and waste removal at the turn of the century, 
I am interested in how objects such as landfill liner or trash cans mediate interest in a collective spatial and environmental matter such as garbage. My argument here would be that without interest, there is no political contestation about an issue such as waste making, which leaves me, uh, which leaves me with the nagging question: How does one become interested in something uh, that we apparently sense? If the task of political life is to turn sensations into perceptions, how do we sense something that is contained and disappeared like waste so effectively? So rather than dismiss the domain of experience as a kind of hijacked terrain, I, would, I wonder how spatial practices such as architecture can, can draw from the routine, even ritualistic, sensorium of daily life and play with how we might engage with wasted matter. So could irritation, for instance, be productive or allow processes associated with waste making to be available to contestation, critique, or even play? So of course, at the back of my mind here is this moment, this incredibly productive political moment in century within which a lot of the kind of boundaries about public space and private space were drawn uh, in the sense that uh, this, this kind of constant sense of engagement over a few decades uh, was contingent on the fact of uh, this kind of sense of irritation. So I would say that this is really an impetus to the exhibition to imagine a series of techniques that mediate engagement with waste of matter which I'll kind of take us through in just a second. So each are in their own way, I, I would argue, of, of what I'm calling a kind of feeling aid. So, which is not to say just to, uh, uh, just for the sake of feeling as such. So to say, uh, I think it, it's, it's very, uh, well, I'm very specific in saying that no, it's not about kind of opening up a trash bag and kind of leaving it on the floor for us all to smell. But I would say that it's 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 a much more kind of mediated engagement with a kind of volatile object such as waste. So in a sense, it's not about feeling as such and kind of going back to that moment, say at the turn of the century, but it's feeling in relation to a particularly productive form of information, which I'll talk about in each of the projects. So in working on these projects, we wanted to shy away from didacticism. So this is how you should think or perceive about ways, which I think is often the kind of conceit of, say, Keep America Beautiful, the recycling movement, which emerged in the 1980s. It's a kind of finger wagging, um, you should be a more responsible uh, citizenry. I would argue, and as I constantly argue kind of to my students, that uh, a lot of these initiatives remain um, somewhat successful, but largely unsuccessful, because they ask that people uh, engage with systems which are whose kind of scale and complexity is not only very secretive, uh, but very difficult to understand. So how does one kind of produce kind of interest through kind of mediation in these systems? How can that uh, mediation and what it produces in terms of potential information about uh, either its, its potential use or kind of afterlife actually be kind of productive to certain urban contexts and the kind of production of, I would say, new uh, spaces of, kind of collective encounter and exchange or merely self-reflection. So rather than kind of uh, dabble in again this kind of moralism, which I think is really interestingly still an inheritance of the 19th century, so again these, a lot of this kind of uh, questions of uh, responsibility, which I find always interesting because they're coupled with a, uh, uh, a kind of anxiousness about interests and interest groups. I mean, I, I think it's so, it's been interesting to, for me to hear in American politics today that this kind of vilification of interest groups. When I actually think that interest is, is totally central to uh, uh, making available certain objects like waste uh, to politicization. So what we want to do here was bring otherwise invisible aspects of the waste stream to different forms of sensory physical engagement and to speculate on the consequences of doing so so we have, in a sense, uh, as I'll speak about, uh, kind of identified potential consequences uh, in, in this uh, spatial and kind of uh, social consequences, even political consequences of what these things might be, although we've also kept it very open-ended in the sense that uh, perhaps going back to my question earlier, what would the unintended consequences be uh, of these objects? I think this is why we also kind of make the objects present in a sense as a prototype. Uh, there's always a kind of ambiguity. 
especially in this kind of phase of work in terms of how something might be used and what, what its consequences might be, which uh, I see as being uh, integrally kind of productive to uh, how they operate as kind of interventions, which are both kind of dis discursive and also uh, very objective. So what I'd like to do is ask everyone to lift up off the chair and enter into <laughs> this kind of field of tables we have. And I'd like to talk to you about a few objects that we've been learning from thinking about in the exhibition we have. And I'd like into uh, some of, not only what we've created, but uh, a lot of the things that we've been learning about which kind of led to these prototypes. So actually, rather than talk about the kind of intervention first, I want to talk about the air quality monitor we talk about. Is anyone familiar with this? So I don't know, do you know a lot about it? Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you want to intervene, you might know more than I do. But I think that uh, I find the bucket is a very interesting um, kind of technical object, actually, because what it's, what it's used for, it's used as a kind of activist and advocacy tool to, uh, to kind of bring awareness, uh, not only a kind of ambiguous social awareness, but kind of institutional awareness uh, and potential uh, kind of justice to uh, the the kind of practices, say, of mostly kind of industrial uh, or brownfield sites where uh, air quality is is uh, actually kind of making people ill. So uh, this was made famous uh, in, well, I think earlier, I'm not sure if Aaron Brockovich used this tool or not, but... I think she mostly used swells. Yeah, it was just swells. Yeah, it was just water quality. But for instance, in Louisiana, around the vinyl industry, uh, what they call the kind of bucket brigades were really instrumental in uh, kind of bringing uh, a lot of the unintended consequences of vinyl production uh, to a kind of political agenda, right? And so people would go, uh, if you watch the movie Blue Vinyl, actually, it's a very, very interesting kind of account of uh, how uh, environmental issues, uh, which are largely kind of clearly enclosed behind the property line of, uh, uh, kind of industrial manufacture, are suddenly made visible in public, and the kind of techniques in which people do that through. So the bucket was an incredibly instrumental way in which this was done, in which uh, basically, so again, correct me if this is wrong, but um, I've just been learning about this too, but basically something is uh, kind of rudimentary, how do you get this thing off? Yeah. That's the kind of dirt devil vacuum, that then, I'm not gonna do this because this isn't my bucket, but uh, it's hooked up to this tube, which then kind of evacuates and creates a kind of negative pressure within the bucket. Uh, and what this does is when it's kind of released as valve, it actually functions as a way to kind of breathe in this exterior air. What I find interesting about the bucket is that it's, it's not um, like any me uh, method of, of kind of recording the environment. It's not perfect. It's, it's in some ways valuable, but it's incredibly productive because what it does is it allows uh, organizations such as Clean Air Coalition in, in Buffalo to actually kind of agitate for, for instance, the DEC or the EPA to send in what are uh, ambient uh, monitoring devices. So this, this was a big issue in Buffalo around the kind of Tonawanda Coke facility controversy. Um, but it, what's worth noting here is that around landfills uh, and industry sites, there is no ambient air quality monitoring. Uh, all air quality monitoring is done based on calculations at the kind of control devices. So for instance, a methane flare. They, can, they know, based on how much methane is going through it, uh, how much, uh, say, how many chemicals are being released into the air. So they can also do this, another kind of what they call a control device at the landfill is, for instance, the, uh, the kind of gas that goes into uh, burn and then drive the turbines. So through these uh, control devices, uh, they actually are able to kind of calculate the pollutants that are, that are emitted into the air. So as you can get a, a kind of quick sense of, uh, basically that places a lot of responsibility uh, and sole responsibility in the hands of those who say own the landfill or own this kind of, uh, own the factory, right? They, all that information is, I think does ultimately find its way into, into the public domain through these different agencies, but I would argue that there, it's to, I wouldn't even, as a kind of common lay person, I wouldn't even know where to access this stuff. I've seen some of these documents, they're not, they're not immediately kind of accessible. So um, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, be able to kind of access a lot of this information, which uh, having now lived in Buffalo and learned a lot about this, uh, we live with uh, uh, 
air quality problems every day in ways that we don't often realize. What's also interesting here about uh, this question, this relationship between the in industry and the landfill is that uh, the EPA actually uses the same requirements that are used to regulate industries for landfills. So for instance, a control device is based on the idea of a factory. And the idea that once a certain level is exceeded, based on those calculations, the factory has to shut down. A landfill cannot shut down. It's a kind of constant, very, as I said, kind of volatile mixture, which is constantly kind of producing chemicals, toxins, uh, into the air, and potentially if it leads into the water supply. So uh, there's a, kind of, a lot of kind of interesting issues that are raised in terms uh, by uh, a kind of very, very kind of almost rudimentary object like this, which is somewhat produced kind of off the shelf. Um, there's also a lot of interesting questions about expertise. Uh, in, in working on this project here, uh, I had a kind of interesting and somewhat tense uh, back and forth with uh, a global, uh, global community monitor who is one of the, uh, well, I'd say a very, very important kind of organization for proliferating these uh, bucket brigades throughout the country. They act as a kind of support network for organizations and citizens who want to monitor air quality. Uh, and they had a very, I think, uh, salient point about even with a, with a kind of potentially DIY technology such as this, that um, they were arguing very strongly for a kind of expertise and training about how one uses these, how one constructs these. I actually requested information about even how they constructed this, and they refused to give it to me. Uh, because they're very anxious about just anyone making this. Why? It's still, to, to speculate a bit on this, I think it's also because of how does one control, say, the kind of quality of air samples, which are then fed back into these very politicized kind of networks of information. So um, in, this, <laughs> in this proposal, what we've done is propose uh, two, two responses to uh, a potential kind of uh, proximity that one lives with near a, near a landfill. Uh, what these buckets monitor primarily is volatile organic compounds in the air. Uh, and so what we propose is what we're calling a kind of window of lungs, which functions based on exactly the same kind of principles of producing a kind of negative air pressure, uh, which then inflates the bag and one can remove periodically. Uh, another kind of big issue in terms of air quality is actually uh, particulate matter. Uh, it's frequently released from landfills. This is a kind of relative scale of the kind of common particulates which are produced by um, the landfill. And so uh, we've actually uh, <coughs> kind of constructed a, a, a kind of screen prototype. I think the the, the, the it's sticky. Yeah. yeah. Which actually apparently I think is used in, in the UK to uh, actually absorb particulate matter in the landfills, which they can then uh, remove the screen, much like we would remove the screen on the window, and then test. The, the kind of amount of particulate which is actually uh, stuck onto the surface. This was an earlier study that a student of mine did last semester, which kind of led to a lot of this investigation, where he positioned uh, a kind of off-the-shelf sticky bag paper on uh, different different kind of spatial moments, some which are mobile like the car, some which are uh, static uh, like the house. Um, but what interests me about the the, the the consequences of this is what does it mean to kind of bring uh, what is still otherwise, even in, in these kind of activist spaces, a kind of very public, uh, quite literally spatially kind of public uh, practice into something like the home. I don't really know what the consequences might be, but I'm very interested in that. Like how would this become a kind of daily ritual? Uh, is it, what kind of consequences would it have for a kind of consciousness and uh, activism? Or does it become activism anymore? Uh, if one were to kind of live in proximity to the landfill and actually need to constantly test this, right? Because I think what, what I found in, in my own experience of learning about a lot of these sites around the country is that though they are, we, we think of them as relatively controlled. For instance, I know in Houston, one of the biggest landfills in Houston was making a lot of people sick. Um, and so uh, these are kind of constant problems about landfills. They, Despite the kind of best intentions of, uh, we tend to kind of, it, we tend to vilify, I think, uh, some of uh, the kind of corporate patrons, or sorry, corporate uh, uh, owners of a lot of these uh, spaces. But uh, I think, you know, at least getting a sense of the kind of work that we're doing regionally, 
there are often good intentions about really trying to work hard to make sure that <laughs> this does not happen, right? But what I find always interesting about something as unpredictable as waste is that it always manages to escape, and it always manages to erode. I'm reminded of this when I've gone to material recovery facilities and seen, for instance, the way that glass literally, when run through a, 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 a steel uh, conveyor, to erodes everything around it, and so they have to replace all the machinery. I mean, waste, even in its, in its very inert form of glass, is incredibly corrosive. And, and I find that this is interesting to me in terms of uh, what are the kind of spatial consequences of this, as I was saying earlier, in terms of where we see uh, certain issues uh, as being uh, public and private. Because I would still argue that much of even a city like Buffalo that we live in is organized spatially uh, in the shadow of a lot of these ideas that came out like essentially public and public responsibility. So I'm interested in how I'm bringing this into the home. Uh, one, it might start to kind of irritate those boundaries in a way and offer potentially new configurations between the public and the private. So I'm actually going to move really quickly through this, but um, I don't know, John, do you want to like explain? No, go, go for it. Okay. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> Uh, uh, I also want you guys to take Whitney and Tim are kind of this, this lovely project and really took it on. I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of them for doing so. Um, this is a standard backyard compost bin. Uh, in the fall, uh, Don had actually proposed something that uh, would operate in the kind of landscape of one's garage, but where a kind of compost state, uh, which one kind of puts into the compost, could actually communicate to an online network. Uh, John was very interested in thinking about a kind of new landscape of compost exchange in the city, which, as we've talked to a lot of composting organizations in the city, has some interesting potential. There are a lot of issues with composting in a city like Buffalo, which come back to the you know, very spatial, urbanistic problems of public and private space, in the sense that one can only compost at a certain scale in the city of Buffalo because of smell, rats and rodents. Basically, again, this question of the container, how things are enclosed. It's always a kind of problem of enclosure and how that enclosure also acts as a kind of mediating system. So here, the kind of enclosure is being imagined also as uh, a kind of device which, like the state, measures the kind of ripeness of the compost based on its kind of heat production. And what John was imagining in, in, in creating this device is that it also uh, then creates a kind of network of exchange. Um, I encourage you to look in the assembly manual that we put together for this because uh, I don't know where Krista is, but Krista also did some interesting work in, in, in kind of visiting many of the composting organizations in the city. There's a lot of very interesting kind of networks of uh, kind of exchange and reciprocity that already take place in the city. So we were very interested in how this kind of networking of uh, perhaps more more quotidian practices of backyard composting that start to kind of feed into our existing networks in the city, for instance. So how could some, how could kind of bringing this information, again, not merely just making it sensible, but making it sensible towards a specific set of consequences, which we can kind of roughly approximate, I would say, um, but which still would need to kind of be tested out in the kind of landscape of the city. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, and then lastly, I'll kind of wrap up so we can go to the discussion. Uh, try not to trip. <laughs> so uh, we also looked at uh, the trash can as a kind of uh, spatial, spatial artifact in a way, or something which actually kind of produces space uh, and, and, and functions really as a kind of technique or technology of communication. Uh, we spoke, what, what was interesting in kind of doing research about trash cans is that there's actually very, very little, pretty much nothing written about uh, uh, the kind of design of trash cans. They are these kind of uh, typologies which are handed down again and again, and which largely seem to kind of respond to a set of uh, uh, demands about security, visibility, smell, and access on the part of uh, um, waste, uh, Sorry, like people who work on garbage trucks who need to pick up the trash. So um, what was interesting is to see a lot of the, the kind of issues that, uh, for instance, we spoke to an industrial designer in New York City, but a lot of the, the issues that an industrial designer thinks about 
in designing trash cans for, say, Midtown Manhattan. Um, what was interesting, what I found very interesting in his discussion with us was this question of communication. Because for him, the trash can was a kind of tool of uh, communication. And so even in its very shape, it communicated certain things to its potential users. So for instance, it was designed in a certain way so that you cannot place something on top of it and it would sit. It always relies on gravity to fall. Uh, it also obviously has to be a certain kind of capacity for the kind of tens of thousands of people that would say walk through Midtown Manhattan. Um, they also put uh, access doors. A lot of the issues of its kind of shape and height are also determined by uh, a potential user on a garbage truck because it's very difficult for people to actually stand uh, you know, too far above and constantly lift bags out of a trash can. And so um, what was interesting is that, you know, for instance, they really espouse using circular trash cans. It's much harder. Uh, you're, you're always at a kind of even distance from, I guess, the bag with a circle versus a square. I mean, there's a lot of kind of very rudimentary kind of mundane things which actually are very interesting in terms of who has access to something like this. And that's where it becomes very interesting to me, again, where uh, how is this access? So for instance, when they design doors on certain large trash cans in New York City, this is a kind of constant dilemma because once you put a kind of access door that somebody can quickly come up and put in a garbage truck uh, without having to kind of hurt one's back and lift the bug and take to the side, that also means that scavengers can come and take trash out of the bag, which as an industrial designer, this person we spoke with in New York City was you know, quite happy that that might happen. But uh, also, uh, in a kind of very regulated district, this is around Bryant Park where this kind of initiative was happening, is a, is a, is a, is a sense of anxiety because again, it starts to kind of irritate and trouble um, those kind of, uh, uh, kind of spatial practices, even, um, well, spatial practices that we associate with a kind of sanitary cleanse space for instance. So I think uh, it was Adrian earlier was talking about with the, uh, this whole uh, discussion about homeless people and the dynamic and things and such. I think here it's totally relevant again uh, to the trash can because it's equally enmeshed uh, in the way in which it's designed and the way in which they're trying to figure out how to make access doors, for instance, accessible or not. I mean, very basic decisions, but which really start to kind of encode larger attitudes about how one uses a kind how one uses space, and I think very critically, who is to inhabit that space. Uh, because even in the design of a trash can, there is this kind of set of regulations about who is a kind of participant in that public environment and who is not. So I think I'll leave it there so we can have uh, some time for discussion.
which is obviously a, a subjectivity position, not an object position per se, even though at the same time, um, you know, we think of things adjectively like trash novels, like trash that describes to now. So, so these ways in which the, uh, people have been using um, the term to describe different things, really. Um, and, and Jordan's um, image of Fontana's can of, of shit is a great example of this because I mean, it was really a commentary about um, a network right, of value that's ascribed to a thing because it's authors, so you have the subject of the author, the person who produces the shit and cans it theoretically, right? Or his minions that can that can his byproducts. And then, you know, the value that then the market gives to that particular thing. And that was like the provocation there that he was already you know, established slasher of, of canvases. And so if you know he is anything that he produced was basically uh, value. So so I just wanted to open the conversation about um, what things that don't have value in themselves but are given um, value either by the way in which they're fashioned, which is a lot of what you were talking about, how you fashion um, the, uh, these ideas, or which always kind of raise the question really, uh, the questions between um, intentionality um, and its use, uh, which seems to be um, kind of um, interesting to people in the discussion so far, right? How do you control um, what you make? To me, this seems pretty, pretty obvious. You can't. I mean, I, I don't know. I think Linda raised it. Was it Linda who raised it? So it's like you made something, and you might have ideas about it, and then it's there. So I, I don't even know how to begin to talk about that today. But there, there is this, um, this, this way in which I think um, the relationship of things of, of no intrinsic value, right? That, that people have a hard time quantifying its value. Or what we were having a discussion about, and um, we was having a discussion with uh, one of the panels for the um, afternoon about how education has come to be seen as broken down into units and therefore will have monetary value. Right? But before you broke it down into units uh, and thought of them as having monetary value, you wouldn't think of yourself as buying an education. Okay? I mean, certainly I never thought of myself as buying an education. I, I paid money to some bursary. And then I went to class. And until it's like made explicit there are like connections, you have this, this problem of quantifying, and, you know, what is a thing which is trash and what's a thing um, which is not. So I just thought since there have been four like very uh, you know broad actually and um, evocative ways of using um, um, the terminology and even referring to um, the motor operation and like
listening to work at the kind of the at the kind of pressure point of the mediated object itself, which is that that how, like how it's tested and how it's potentially kind of communicated. Because I think it's ultimately a kind of partial object in the way in which it would relate to say whatever community organizations are already there and doing this kind of work, for instance, or potentially new collectivities that would emerge. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that that's always an interesting question, to me at least in kind of <coughs> culture right now. Um, I think there's there's a problematic there in that. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a hat for the bucket perspective. There's a, hat, a large portion of that object that's missing, which is the lab, right? right. The bucket is worthless without a lab. Sure. Um, and the information that the bucket produces is worthless without a lab. It's just paper, basically. Right. Um, and so I think that that gets back to your question as well, is that, um, and even with access to that lab knowledge, those are just numbers, right? And so then you need have to have a of data to actually make conclusions. And there's a wide range of discussions around what those numbers actually mean, especially in terms of lead and other heavy metals in the soil and uh, particulates and VOCs and other contaminants in air. Um, so there's not really, I think in terms of an object-based conversation, um, the lab is an important part. Um, I, I don't think, I don't propose that we get into epidemiology here, because I think that's sort of beyond the scope of what's being shown and what's being discussed here. But, um, I think that it is also important to acknowledge that, that I mean, even if you had all the, the data in the world, you still have to make a decision. Well, I think it makes sense to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, I mean, just to what you're just saying reminds me a little bit of the work that's going on at the Center for Network Sensing in uh, UCLA, Mark Hansen's project. The, students, the Center for Network Sensing. Oh. Um, and so they've built these things that are just air quality monitors attached to people's cell phones. And so people can do kind of point um, air quality monitoring throughout Los Angeles. And all that information is, is network consent and then organized. And you know, probably in the way that EPA regulates smog in, in Los Angeles, or you know, everywhere, but I happen to know in Los Angeles, is that they don't they average all the ratings. Um, so you, you know, and in fact air quality varies dramatically um, depending on where you are <laughs> in the city. Right. Um, and so you know, in terms of what will be a trigger for uh, a federal kind of um, intervention. It's just about the average rating amongst, I think, really like eight points that they put out throughout the city. And there's a lot of legislation right now figuring out at what level is the appropriate level to um, average in that data, which is kind of pushing, kind of catching you know, this personal sensing and um, kind of like a group kind of laboratory analysis. I was going to pick up on something different, but now I have to start with this because it's very interesting to me for so many reasons. One is that I don't know if it all involved, but there was a nearly identical sounding initiative that was started about uh, six years ago by a guy named Eric Paulos, who is at Intel Berkeley Labs. It's kind of interesting community <coughs> partnerships where Intel sets up labs that are completely non-commercial in their reputation, they don't have any burden on the people involved to have any kind of applicability of what's done, but they're always in proximity to the they don't have any official so maybe I'm very naive, but I find it very provocative. Um, so Eric was doing a very, very similar initiative, and it was very workshop-based, where he gathered together people of all walks of life who were interested. Start by just saying, so what's in your cell phone? Can you do oh, it sense that there was a camera, it can sense light, there was an uh, accelerometer, so it can sense its position. So it starts to awaken people's awareness of uh, what their devices already do, and then you would uh, work toward adding that very uh, uh, minor kind of dongle to let it collect and share data locally and on the go. But to try and hook it back to the DOS's provocation, I feel, uh, I'll try and state this as a question, I think that I also find very interesting, it's not surprising that we are all bringing up many different words and, and broad worlds of, uh, of waste, of trash. Um, but what I start to wonder is, uh, as each of them invokes and defines itself in a particular context, uh, if there isn't one that 
is essential to the poem. So, by example, I have been trying to argue that in all these cases that we are byproducts. And you very literally said we are products. And I wonder if all forms of trash that we've talking about so far could not exist before there was a product. The waste doesn't happen until something is made. And if uh, if capitalism itself is not an essential part, uh, before we even get into an ecological critique, if it's not somehow underlying the discussion of every form of waste. So that's a, a question I put to everybody. That's not coincidental, but actually absolutely That's the level's argument in his biggest consumption for that in his biggest consumption. But in theory, this is why this is the, the very productive necessity for increasing waste stream as, as we you know, consume conspicuously. So I don't know that now. But, um, uh, but that, the, the, but, uh, you know, the point is, uh, I think also a little well made by the environmental aphorism that there is no way right, um, that, um, that, you know, when you throw something, <laughs> so, and, um, and so it's the recognizance of what we now call a way um, that matters. Right? I think you said earlier, it's, it's, it's not as if it's not as if processes will change such that waste isn't produced and even if minimized. That process of producing minimization produces other effects, right? You know, so I look at, for example, I mean, I'm intrigued by your word and immediately fly to another composting thing. I'm like, okay, so now we have a composting with a sensor. A solar cell, <laughs> a wire, uh, right? You know, housing, uh, yeah. you know, and so now all of a sudden the very desire or the shift for me going out and putting my hand in it and saying, "Yeah, hey, it's about three degrees," which is what I do now, um, uh, to like having my cell phone turn on to receive data stored in the cloud on what the temperature of my compost is 150 degrees from me is, you know, like all of a sudden, like, yeah, okay, so would we gain and we lose, right? And so it's that it's that great thought that I think matters. So to what extent are the gains? leveraged in an interesting way, right? So I was also thinking about the window system and a particular matter that came to my attention when you were describing that, when you asked the question about how people would fold this into rituals, is the golf ball. Um, uh, and if you speak to people in golf course communities, there's a really interesting trade-off in terms of either re-engineering their windows or in being happy to replace them with right. some frequency um, because of the benefit of having that proximity, right? So it's, you know, I, I gain the advantage of having a course membership or just pretending like I have course membership by backing up the golf course. Um, and the trade-off is that I replace my dining window every you know, two or three times a year. But, you know, and, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's one of the things. So there, you know, there are special windows designed, and, you know, obviously with non-breakable materials or materials that don't break as frequently. But it's an interesting issue, right? So it's the exact same issue, which is what is the benefit that you provide someone What's, what's your version of playing golf? Right. 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 Well, there's also a like, problem I genuinely have never thought of. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the projectile? Never mind the glass. Mm -hmm. The thing comes flying through the glass. And you're in the house. Yeah, yeah, well, apparently that happens. That happens, and that's been resolved. So, you know. What by not having rooms that face the golf course? Or using, you know, using uh, materials that, that, that less the impact. We'll make my first way around the second. Yeah, no, I mean, there's an entire science about this. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. No, it was, it was whatever I said, it was scrapped. <laughs> it was scrapped. It was scrapped. It was scrapped. Well, no, I was just thinking uh, of this uh, Hadass and Jordan. There's this fantastic book by Zeno Bauman called Voice of Life, in which he he produces a very close association between uh, waste of matter and kind of waste of forms of life, which is to say, all of those which have kind of been left outside of the kind of on our trajectory of modernity in a sense. Um, and I find kind of urbanistically that history very interesting because having worked a lot in India, that there's always this close association between the physical presence of trash and, for instance, uh, as I was saying, these kind of notions of moral behavior, and specifically the kind of Ill, supposed ills of slums, even though those slums are actually very kind of 
productive and, and livable spaces. Um, but that, that kind of association has always been very directly made uh, between uh, how one lives, who one is, even in terms of an India, in terms of their caste and class, and the kind of presence of, of waste, with the uh, kind of physical, sensory kind of presence of waste. So I always find this kind of ambiguity is also very difficult because in, in the case of, for instance, uh, in India now, um, scavenging constitutes a, a, a uh, important kind of way for uh, people coming into the city who are part of uh, some of the kind of poorest classes in the country to actually kind of enter into the economy of large cities in India. What it also means is that they are exposed to the kind of deleterious consequences of all that waste. So for instance, meals uh, that people have discarded. Uh, one, one kind of dump, informal downside that I looked at, everyone was kind of spreading rumors about the fact that, oh, you know, she's got HIV because she's living in the trash and just like this. So the, uh, it's, they're very kind of complicated situations, actually. Uh, and uh, they're both, those kind of sites are very productive in some ways to the kind of livelihoods of these people, but are also very harmful. And so what I always find interesting is to see how that's responded to in terms of, say, activism in the city. Does that mean you give them better shoes and gloves? Does that mean you kind of agitate, for instance, like some people do, to say that why are all the sweepers in the city dollars who are basically untouchables? So there's there's a lot of kind of very uh, contested questions around. Wouldn't the obvious question to ask you why these people have to subsist on and, yeah, well, I mean, there's, and, it's those, and there's larger structural questions, but I think that for people working on those issues, they're really, really trying to kind of mitigate uh, what they can, and so to deal with the kind of larger structural questions is present, but it's just too difficult to engage with as a, as a kind of an activist. efficiency systems. 
So yeah, I mean, they're interesting. I'm not coming in a value judgment on that one, but I think it's an interesting sort of conversion or, or, or question. What about just in, in your research right now, what about the difference between the
uh, a larger question, say, in, in the Emirates right now about citizenship or you know, how one behaves in public space, what, what, what uh, kinds of uh, social life do we imagine in those spaces? Because to me, there's always a relationship. I'm very interested in the, the kind of humanities ways to and how they also kind of cut out a lot of aspects of the process that we would otherwise kind of negate with and literally see. And I'm very kind of interested in what the implications of that uh, kind of visualization are. At the same time, that it's kind of coming back to us as a patient and telling us, oh, you're eating too much. I mean, it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh, development of what the kind of whole garbage archaeology movement uh, uh, research project was doing uh, in the University of Arizona, where they're actually going through trash and saying, you know, what are people actually consuming? And they were trained archaeologists doing this. It was kind of in the media. It's still the ongoing, actually, but saying, you're drinking more than you think you do, actually. But waste is always held up as this kind of, uh, uh, you know, as a kind of truth artifact in a way. Like, you think you do this, but you actually do this. So it's interesting to see when we talk about these kind of other systems of control, for instance, how a pneumatic system also relates to an idea or kind of model of managing you know, of governance in a certain kind of context and how one is imagined to participate in that as a citizen um, and so forth, but you know. Yeah, I want to tell you, I enjoyed uh, my really enjoyed picture back to experience. And I like to think about that relationship with this comment about production and capitalism, and then notions of like, immaterial labor. And um, it seems like this whole conversation with objects and experiences, on the one hand, Brian, you're talking about Materialization of objects into experience. It's where you ended, anyway. Um, and it seemed like, uh, Kurt, you're interested in the molecular materialization of experience mm -hmm. in a certain way. But, um, but how does that relate to the way we conceive of production today in terms of you know, uh, this, this new regime of material labor that, that the Italian theorists have kind of linked to post fordism this kind of movement or another movement that toward or as a kind of movement from the production of commodities to the production of images to the production of affects or experiences in late capitalism. But as we dematerialize things, or as we talk about the dematerialization of things, what is the, the, the regime of waste or, or material production and it's the waste that accrued from it that go along with that kind of ostensible dematerialization of things into experiences? In a sense. And, and so uh, what I like about this conversation is it kind of, on the one hand, insists on this radical, um, a new kind of commodity, the commodity of experience, this kind of incredibly immaterial commodity. But on the other hand, it insists on the persistent materiality that's required to produce that experience in a sense that they never really, one doesn't replace the other in a sense. It's kind of like, like Alan Sekulow's work on on the flows of the sea, like that networks and flows are absolutely not immaterial. They're absolutely material at the same time. They continue and persist in being material. So I, I guess I'm interested in a kind of maybe latent argument between the two talks around um, materiality and immateriality in a way that I think in some ways played out in the first session too between Jordan and I. Um, but obviously what we're interested in is the linkages between that dematerialization Assistant materiality. Right. Yeah, it's a great observation. Should we do that? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk at the same time. <laughs> I didn't, I, no, I didn't. I was, oh, okay. I, I'm, 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 I'm digesting. I'm digesting also. Well, I, I, I think where, where you wrapped up the, 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 the citations and, and your point about the, the, the manifold complexity of this, I think. Important. And as it ties towards questions of labor, at least I, I understand, uh, I can understand that in a couple of different ways. Um, one, tying directly to the questions of waste in these large scale developments um, with regard to labor and, and the practice, right? So um, you know that the, the labor there is, is primarily Persian and, and um, South Indian labor that is imported um, to get those products done. And the, the Dubai Mall, for example, that I was um, studying. Uh, had 10,000 laborers uh, working 24 hours a day on that project. Um, and again, this is through criminal heat. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely disgusting. 45, 50 degrees Celsius summers. Um, uh, and, uh, and so 
you know, the entire city was there to build that mall for that, that you know, the mall <laughs> uh, of all things. Um, and, uh, and so on one hand, there's that, there's the practice of labor to produce these things and the, the you know, inhumane and, 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 you know, not to mention ecologically deleterious products there. And then, of course, there's the other implication of labor um, within the experience economy, um, which has to do with, uh, when you yourself talk about the dematerialization, um, uh, shifting or actually better yet integrating the burden of promoting experience from environment to environment and labor, right? So now we're talking a different form of labor, which is not the labor of production of the artifact, but of the production of the experience on an ongoing basis. And so this runs from the, you know, the, the barista at the Starbucks who has to announce names and, and you know, act like they're somehow your friend. Um, to uh, people in the more kind of extreme uh, experience economy where there are specific narratives that have to be performed and garb that has to be worn um, in order to promote that experience in, in, in very strange conditions. I mean, in my book, I feel a whole bunch of these weird kind of labor conditions. Um, and, uh, and so there's this kind of um, enfolding of human agency into the very manufacturing, continual, ongoing production of experience, which is very different than the, the, let's say, one time labor in a different category to produce the thing that ultimately allows that experience to be produced. Um, but again, we rely on the spreading out or the complex integration of 